on the whole time and we're going to start the video okay right okay hi hi <laughs> right right this is that's all good <laughs> and this this was recording correct yes press pause to stop recording so it is recording okay um all right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. I'm Antonia Ferraro Martinelli. I'm the president of CC15. We are here tonight, April 3rd, 2024, for our uh, CEC candidate interviews. As you know, we have a vacancy on the council for one member. Uh, we have six uh we should have six candidates um on the call i am not sure if they're all here or not um but i will check in on that in a second um yeah i want to provide you all with um the candidate statements i'm putting a link in the chat to the candidate statements. Uh, and I want to give the interpreters an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, we only, unfortunately, and I apologize for this, we only have Spanish interpretation tonight. Uh, would the interpreter please introduce themselves? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, should I just give the information for those for those ones who want to connect into the Spanish line? Then I'm sorry. The thing is that I can hear you over the Spanish line, so it's kind of echoing. Oh, because you because have... I have okay. She should take okay. Sorry to do this. Um. Um, so why is that not working? Is this line over um, here? Um, is it echoing now? I can't even hear you. Um, yes, yes, you still do there. Yeah, I need to put in my earphones to have to hear him. I don't know. Um, did you have an opportunity to introduce yourself, translator? Not really. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of confusing with, with the background okay. noise, but it's okay. Okay. Uh, the Spanish announcement, uh, para quienes requieran traducción e interpretación en español, por favor llamar a la línea 347-966- 4114 e ingrese el código de conferencia número 988-258-642 con el símbolo numeral. Una vez ingrese a la llamada, por favor silencie el micrófono de su teléfono y silencie el audio de Zoom para evitar ruido de fondo. Una vez más, llamar al 347-966-4114 e ingrese el código de conferencia 988-258-642, numeral. La información va a quedar en el chat de Zoom. Thank you so much. That's the Spanish announcement. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, can everybody on the line hear me well? Is there a lot of echo? Okay. We still hear the echo on the Spanish line. You, you would need to mute... Line. You would need to mute yourself on the Spanish line. So oh, that's the problem. we can't hear you. Computer. Hold on. Thank you.
Okay, how's that? Is that better? No, we can still hear the echo. I'm I'm sorry. I'm without my administrative assistant assistant who usually does all this tonight. Um, let me see what I can do. Oh, are they hearing it through there as well? Can you make that? Is that better? Can you, do you hear echo now? Now it's good. Now I don't hear an echo. Yeah, that's it. Thank now you. Now it's good. Thank okay. you. I left Thank the you. team. I had to leave the team's meeting, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I'll uh, call the roll. Um, Antonio Ferraro, yes, I'm here. Leslie King, here. Uh, Vanessa Uoka, I believe she is on the Zoom. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Nancy Cruz, are you on the Zoom? I don't see Nancy. Mm -mm. Um, Denalda Chumney said she was going to be absent. Nancy Randall, are you on the? She's on the. She's on. The... I'm on the Zoom. Okay, great. Hans Arietta. I thought I saw Hans on the. He's on the list. Here I am. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Lauren Barkin. I'm here. Okay. Wonderful. Mamoon Rashid said he was going to be out. Uh, Danley Vidal. I'm not seeing her. Uh, Jonathan Davis said he was not going to be able to make it, and I don't see our high school member, Anneli Diada. Okay. And we have our President's Council President, Elton Dodson. He is present. So um, I want to thank the council members who are here with us tonight, and thank you to the District 15 office for their support, and their many and our many thanks to the President's Council and those who could be here. I want to thank all the candidates um, who made an effort to be here tonight in spite of the weather. Um, our council, we will have candidates who are also on the Zoom presenting. Um, and um, we, although members of the public cannot vote on who uh, becomes the, who accepts the seat, um, they, we appreciate their feedback and we hope they send their feedback to us via email, um, as well as participate um, in this forum. Uh, tonight, you will hear the candidates talk about why they should be elected to serve on the council, and I do recommend that you take notes. Before we meet the candidates individually, let's go over the rules of this uh, forum and our community norms. Candidates may speak for up to three minutes and will be called on in random order. We will ask two questions of each candidate. Actually, that's not correct. We're going to ask more than two questions of each uh, candidate. Um, CC council members may have follow-up questions. If time permits, we will open the floor to the public for questions. Um, we ask that candidates please be polite and respectful. Personal questions will not be allowed. Please keep yourself muted when not speaking. Refrain from interrupting the candidates or speaking without being invited by the moderator. Please be concise in your responses. When your time is up, you will be muted to allow the other candidates an equal opportunity to speak. 
Remember, this is your opportunity to introduce yourself to the community and demonstrate that you will be a valuable member of this education council. Our candidates for this evening are Katina Rogers, who is here in person, uh, Isabel Mendoza. Is Isabel Mendoza on the line? I don't see Isabel Mendoza's name here on the line. All right, so she might not be here. Uh, Teresa Council. I'm here. Great, nice to meet you. Jocelyn Bonadio de Freitas. Hi. Hi, thank you for joining us. Dana Ashley. Hi. Hi there. And Yasmin Uday. Hi, I'm here. I'm not feeling well, but I'm here. <laughs> thank you for thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, I guess we'll keep an eye out if Isabel Mendoza arrives later. Um, so I'm gonna start with Katina Rogers, who is here in person. Um, Tell us something about yourself and why you're running for the Education Council seat. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's nice to be here in person, actually, despite the weather, but um, I really appreciate everyone making the effort online, too. Uh, my name is Katina Rogers. I'm the parent of a first grader and a fourth grader at PS10. Um, I've served as co-treasurer at PS10's, uh, of PS10's PTA for the last two years, and I was a class parent before that. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my professional background and the perspectives that I've come to hold in the last few years as a D15 parent. Um, so professionally, I hold a PhD in comparative literature, and I've worked in education for the last 15 years. Um, most of my work has focused on universities and graduate education, um, but many of the issues that I've dealt with in that context are similar to the challenges facing New York City schools. This was especially true at CUNY, where I worked for seven years as a program director. CUNY was constantly fighting austerity budgets from both the city and the state, while also trying to serve over 500,000 uh, New York City students of all ages and walks of life. With both my kids now in elementary school, and especially in my role as co-treasurer of the PTA, I've come to see the intense pressure that our district's principals, teachers, and staff are under and how that affects our kids and our community. I've decided to seek the CEC role because I want to help fight, not just for my kids' school, but for all our district schools. It's been interesting recently uh, to be at PS10. PS10 is losing its Title I funding next year, and as a school community, we've really been grappling with what that means, not just in terms of the budget challenges that it obviously poses, for us, but also how our school community has shifted over time and continues to evolve. I think that the challenges that we've been facing there in terms of how to foster community and how to support equity, while also advocating for greater funding and support so that everyone can do their best work, are challenges that are shared by the district as a whole. I know that I have a lot to learn, um, but it would be an honor to represent our community as part of the CEC team. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I will ask if Isabel Mendoza is here one more time. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't. I don't see Isabel Mendoza. Okay. Um, now, uh, the next person I want to call on is Teresa Council, but I want to make sure everybody in this room can hear Teresa yeah. Council, so I need to unmute myself and mute that. So, Good evening. Can you hear me? Good? Okay. Hello, good evening, everyone. Sorry I couldn't make it there. The weather would have made it impossible for me to get there on time, but I'm, I'm happy to join everyone. So my name is Teresa Council. I am the parent of a first grader at PS 130, um, the Parkside School. I'm currently co-chair of the Health and Nutrition Committee uh, on the PTA, an active PTA member, and also the class parent representative for my son's class. 
I'm an involved member of the PS130 community and have volunteered at most events since my son's son started school in kindergarten last year. PS130 is also losing its Title I funding. Um, so this is something that we've also been grappling with in our executive board and PTA meetings, and just kind of thinking about the effect that it has um, on the school for the upcoming year. Um, professionally, I've been working in nonprofit, um, in the nonprofit world for over 25 years, mainly focusing on education, health, nutrition, and wellness. I have a passion for childhood, early childhood education and diversity and equity in the school system. Um, I'm an executive director at Cypress Hills Child Care Organization, whose goal is to promote children's optimal development, including their health and school readiness through providing early ch childhood education in the underserved area of Cypress Hills, Brooklyn. Um, we also support families to strengthen their parenting abilities through support and services to provi and provide opportunities for employment and entrepreneurship. Um, I think, you know, my passion for education and also my intense interest in the way that decisions are made in our schools and just the betterment of our schools led me to this. I'd like to be part of the council so that I may further understand the system in which decisions are made regarding the education and curricula in D15. Um, I'd like to be a voice for the parents um, who want the best uh, possible education environments at their school. I think I, my profession and my background um, would give me good perspective um, and I'd be able to add that. Um, I have you know, a background in working with diverse populations and underserved communities. And I also understand the complexities of budgets um, and how those affect the programs that we're able to offer. So you know, I'm honored to be here. I look forward to you know, answering questions and being part of this process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... All right, we will move on to Jocelyn Bonadio de Freitas. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to hear from me tonight and I'm already incredibly impressed with the other moms in uh, the district who are hoping to serve in this role. Obviously there's gonna be an awesome person uh, chosen to contribute here. Um, I am the mother of a three and a half year old, um, which means I was pregnant for most of 2020 and gave birth in 2020. Um, that three and a half year old is now at the very beginning of their education journey as a recipient of a 3K seat um, at a uh, universal three and 4K preschool on 7th Avenue and Park Slope. Um, so at the very, very beginning of a commitment to a public school journey um, here as a parent in Brooklyn, uh, personally, I am in the arts. Um, I'm a lifelong musician and music teacher, and the arts are my entry point into education. Um, I have studied arts uh, at Brooklyn College, where I have a uh, music performance degree and then went on to get an arts and education degree. Um, so I have a foundation in arts and arts pedagogy, but really I, I have just loved and enjoyed teaching music and arts to New Yorkers and running arts programs. Um, so my last role was the director of education at the town hall, which is a big theater in Manhattan. And we, I was in charge of running arts programs in all boroughs, including some really special uh, intergenerational programs, which I have a lot of faith in and a lot of fluency, therefore, with the grants that help those supplemental arts programs thrive and how you bring teaching artists and, and leverage the school's cultural or the city's rather cultural uh, richness into a learning environment in the school. Um, that also includes a lot of after-school programming that I uh, had the opportunity and, and pleasure to run at the Lower East Side Girls Club. And uh, also just wanted to mention, um, I'm Puerto Rican, I speak Spanish, I uh, have done training at El Puente um, in Williamsburg part of their Global Fellows cohort with the Caribbean Cultural Center Africa Diaspora Institute um, they had an innovative cultural advocacy fellowship. Um, so had some really, and, and also Lincoln Center education. 
So through the city also, I've had some really incredible experiences to learn about arts in our civic, you know, bureaucratic, um, funded, not funded, nonprofit, uh, public school context. And I would love to see more and more arts, obviously. Um, and I'm very concerned about the potential pullback on 3K, um, the funding that's gonna come up at the end of 25 with the end of the COVID funding. Um, the 3K seat has made a huge difference in the finances for my family. Um, and so I'm actively feeling how important those seats are. Um, and yeah, I would be honored to be part of this. Um, but again, it sounds like there's a lot of wonderful people um, who are stepping up. So thank you for taking the time to hear me out. Dana, sorry, uh, Dana Ashley. It, is Dana Ashley on the call? She was. I thought she was. Oh, she's just, okay, we just readmitted her. There we go. Hi, Dana, are you with us? Hmm. I'm I'm back. Okay, My computer great. shut down in the middle of everything oh, and just no. like, oh, oh, no. down. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're back with us. Um, tell us uh, something about yourself and why you're running for CEC. Okay. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, it's so nice to be here with all of you. Um, sort of. <laughs> Uh, I'd hope to be there in person, but um, childcare, you know. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, my name's Dana Ashley. I live um, obviously in District 15 and my son goes to PS 39 in first grade. And um, I was born and raised in New York City. Uh, my mom was a New York City public school high, sc uh, high school art teacher. And so um, even though I am not an artist and I didn't come to this through the arts in everything I do, I, I think it, it means so much to how we, how we engage, uh, with our student, with the students in our schools and our kids. Um, so for the past two decades, um, I worked for the DOE. Um, I started out as a social worker in district 75 and, um, through that work, uh, I learned so much about sort of the punitive nature of our system and what it was doing to our children, particularly the black and brown children in our schools, and how the you know saw the direct effects of exclusion um, on them. And so through the years, years later, I'm older than I wish. Okay, um, I joined with the teachers union and the DOE together to start an initiative um, called the Positive Learning Collaborative. Um, in which we, the goal was to really uh, train teachers and principals and district leaders in, at the core, understanding behavior, understanding, understanding healing-centered practices, and then be in the classrooms with them to implement it. Um, really seeing how, do, how can we really truly transform school climate? And through that, you know, uh, the job ended up being a whole lot of lobbying and budgets and funding. And we lobbied for city council funds and got them for many years. So I handled all of those budgets. Um, we had really good outcomes in reducing suspensions, reducing incidents and improving school climate. The challenges, you know, we saw were, were there every day and, you know, COVID hit and morale went up and then morale went really far down and the budget cuts and everything else, you know, it was all mental health, mental health, mental health. And then you turn around and um, it's back to test scores, test scores, test scores. And, you know, over time we saw, you know, just a lot of lip service being given to the real, real supports that our schools needed. Um, I was on the mayor's school discipline and climate change committee, former mayor, former mayor years ago. Um, 
as well as I'm part of the Healing Centered Working Group um, that has supported really right now District 9 in um, uh, providing coaching support and training and healing centered practices, um, as well as uh, I've got about 16,000 sensory toolkits into our school classrooms uh, to support our students. Um, but that being said, I worked in districts all over the city that were not ours. And when I decided to leave the DOE, um, I felt that I've been put, I have all of this experience and I put so much into it for everyone else. Um, and now I have a child in a school that, and he's, he's getting a great education. I love our school, but every kid should have that. And I feel like, you know, at this point in, in my life, in my career, I want to be able to use what I've learned from so many leaders out there, so many teachers to support this district in any way I possibly can. Um, so I appreciate, uh, your time and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, Yasmin, you day. Hi, how are you guys? Good, good. Thank you for joining us. So just uh, uh, tell thank something you about yourself and why you would like to be a member of CEC 15. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, everyone. And I hope you could understand me correctly. I have a really bad um, illness going on right now. So it's better that I'm not in person spreading. Um, so my background is uh, with nursing and with education. Um, I've been a nurse for a, a pretty long time. Um, uh, so even before I became a registered nurse, I was also an LPN and a nurse's aide. So I started from the bottom and now I'm here. Um, uh, so starting from early on, part of the um, Department of Education uh, with an agency where I work as a covering school nurse. So I got to experience the way uh, schools are run in different districts, including District 75 schools. Um, I also work, uh, um, so not just with covering school nurses while they were out, um, but also worked with a family on a one-to-one -one, um, case where I had to go on the yellow school bus with um, my student that I would take care of. She was a ventil uh, ventilated um, patient, patient student. Um, and I got really close with the family. And uh, so I saw all the barriers, not just with how um, DOE works, but with school busing and um, like, uh, uh, how should I explain this? Um, all the delays that uh, with the way things work in terms of um, having to get up earlier, the, the students would have to get up earlier in order to get all the students onto the bus. And then the smell of the smog on the yellow school buses. And on top of it, I was also pregnant during that time. So that didn't help. Um, so I felt what the students were feeling. Um, in the classroom setting, the staff, um, I, so this is additional barriers. I saw the amount of work that staff put in and the amount of things that they had to deal with. And so even me as a nurse, I wasn't there to help the teachers per se, but I was helping as much as I can in terms of redirecting the students. Um, and so my nursing background helps as well in terms of caring and um, and. Uh, caring not just about the students and the peers, but also about the family and um, their complaints. Uh, they, there, there were a lot of complaints specifically about the school busing. And uh, things take time with the DOE. And that's one thing that we needed to reiterate um, whenever we needed to get things done or um, to pass uh, any issues along. It, it's a process and it takes time and it takes a lot of patience. Um, so I know that I would, I know that I have a lot to offer to be part of the CEC, um, but I don't know why I'm just so nervous. Uh, I'm even more nervous with this interview process than I am with jobs that I do get paid for. <laughs> so, I, oh, so, I mean, 
it is what it is. I know what I have to offer. My nursing background helps. Um, I have a master's degree in nursing education. I work um, as a nurse educator now in helping, um, uh, in helping facilitate a nurse residency program to try to maintain, uh, um, to try to improve retention rates in terms of nurses. Um, and I'm hoping that um, I'm, I know that I, I could, um, you are not alone with the nerves. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Um, so I see the different issues that are going on. And if we had an unlimited budget, yeah, that would solve like a, a lot of issues that we do have. Then we could have had cleaner school buses. Um, we could have had more staff to help in the classroom. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I really want this seat, especially because both my kids are in uh, District 15, so that helps also. I, I, I enjoy attending CEC meetings and I try to bring my daughter's um, par uh, classmate parents to join, but it seems like I'm the only one from the school that does any kind of advocating, but it's okay. I'll, I'll advocate for the school. Um, one thing I do love, uh, love about the, my daughter's in a pre-K program at the Little Brooklyn PK Center and uh, the assistant principal, she selected me from the school to be part of the legislative breakfast. And that was an honor. And just that exposure from the legislative breakfast and just even attending the CEC meetings with you, Antonia and Jonathan, just to see like how things work. I admire that and, and I wanna be part of it. Wonderful. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you so much. I just wanna give Isabel Mendoza another call. If she is on the line, uh, I, I, I guess not. Okay. All right, let's, um, let's go to the next, uh, the next question is going to be read by Leslie and we're going to go in a different order than we did before. I'm just gonna turn it <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. Um, I want to talk a bit about CEC 15. Um, as you know, this is a very active council. Um, we have a minimum of two meetings in a month. There may be more. Uh, we spend a lot of time researching education issues. Uh, we write resolutions. We work with our liaison schools to advocate for their needs. Um, this is a big time commitment. Um, how do you see yourself contributing to the council? So my question to you, I'm going to call Dana. Um, how do you see yourself contributing to this council? Let's so time. Hopefully my computer is not crashing. Um, well, let's start with I left my full time job for the reason that, you know, it time was why I probably I couldn't do a lot of the things I wanted to do before I was working for, and I also was working for the DOE. Um, therefore, I felt that I couldn't really bring my work home with me. You know, I already did. <clears throat> However, I, I believe so much in education in this city, and I know a lot about it, and I understand the inner workings of our schools. I know what teachers go through in the classrooms because I spent almost 20 years in classrooms coaching teachers, coaching principals. I also really understand why things land and they don't. Why is it that certain policies, certain practices, certain programs get embraced and others you know, fall by the wayside? Um, because I've seen it and I've been part of it and I had to manipulate and work through my program to make sure that people were embracing the work and weren't turning away from it, you know, especially when you're doing culturally and historically responsive work, you know, you, you have to be able to walk in a back door and a front door. It just depends on, you know, where people are at. So, you know, especially as a social worker, understanding how a policy is going to be interpreted um, is something I think I can, I can really offer. And now at this point, the time commitment for me is, um, is not, I mean, I still have a kid and I still am working, but not in any way like I was before. And, um, it, it is, does not phase me to be putting in work to our education system. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, now I'm going to ask the same question of Jocelyn. Um, how do you see yourself contributing to the council? I appreciate the question. Um, I think that, I mean, I'm on, I've been on boards before. I'm on the board of my uh, son's 3K now. And so I'm familiar with the type of evening after hours, you know, there's going to be long threads that are, you have to pay attention to documents shared. Um, respecting people's time means knowing what you're assigned to do, understanding the expectations, which I'm sure are delivered clearly at this point and, and treating it like a deadline, like anything else of priority in your life. I appreciate you highlighting the time commitment because I think that is extremely important for working parents to accept and understand. Um, I co-parent my child, so I am sometimes with him and sometimes without him. And I know that having that time to myself on a regular schedule helps me recuperate and make sure that I am managing my time well so that I can be present for all of the commitments that I have. Um, and certainly, uh, I think parents and moms are superstars when it comes to managing their time. Um, but I, I do certainly appreciate you pointing that out. I think um, I, like I said, bring a network that is mostly entrenched in the arts. Um, I think that that just is my my background. Um, and I would love to see how those connections could potentially come to bear on projects that are happening on schools in the district. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that there's a big literacy effort um, and, and, you know, curriculums being developed and um, this incoming and ongoing budget crises will require um, different levels of advocacy. I'm certainly not happy with the current mayor. Um, there's probably no shortage of uh, issues that could be responded to, um, but I do very much appreciate you pointing out the realities of the time commitment for this. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, Yasmin? Um, I'll ask you the same question. Um, but how do you see yourself contributing to the council? Okay, so what I needed to look up first and what I did earlier today is to um, first understand what the role of a CEC member does. And so what I found is uh, contributing to decisions made around school district zoning, um, the educational material, school buildings, academics, budget, transportation, safety, accessibility, diversity and inclusion, special education needs, and provide comment, discussion, and recommendations for the district education policy. So that's what I found as, like, uh, in general, what our role is. Um, so then how do I see myself in contributing to this council with anything that is presented? I always want to hear everyone out. So whether it's staff, family, whatever issues that are coming, I'd like to gather up all the facts and, um, and, and not to be afraid to ask questions if I don't understand. Uh, so I hope I'm answering this question correctly. Um, but again, um, this role requires patience and professionalism, and these are all things that I could bring um, with um, joining the CEC. So I hope that's a good answer. <laughs> yes, Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, is Isabel on the line with us? I don't think I see her. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, Katina. Sure. Okay. So, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Okay. How's that sound? Okay. Yeah. So, right. how do you see yourself contributing to the council? Yeah. Um. There's lots of things I imagine, and it's it's hard to know, you know, until um until you're feet are really on the ground, um, kind of where your, where your place ends up being. Um, I love researching and writing. That's like the bread and butter of what I do um, in my work. And um, uh, it's something that I enjoy. Um, 
So in a concrete way, I think, you know, supporting the research efforts and writing resolutions is something that I would, um, where I could take an active hand. Um, in a less concrete way, I think that a strength that I bring, um, and I see a number of my PS10 PTA colleagues and friends on the line, um, and so they can uh, speak against this if it's not true, but um, I think that I bring um, an ability to hear all viewpoints, to synthesize complex information really well, um, and to hear the patterns, both in what's being said and what's not being said, and to represent that back to the community in a meaningful way. Um, and so one of the things that I hope that I would be able to do in a CEC context, and that I think has been important in the PTA context, um, is to work on bringing some of those threads together and to hold a balance between um, that listening and that kind of softness and warmth on one hand, and the strength that I think is also required when there are moments of needing to push. Um, I've been really inspired to hear in some of the CEC meetings the ways that different members are using their voices um, and continuing to you know, to ask questions and to ask them again when the answers are not um, not forthcoming or don't feel uh, fully transparent. Um, it's something that I admire and that I strive to do. And so um, working to represent the various viewpoints both that I share and those that I don't um, would be something that I hope I would bring. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn this back. Thank you for me. <laughs> Hold on. I have to bring up the volume. Okay. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful um, answers. And now I'm going to. Did you get everybody? Oh, you know what? I didn't. I skipped her. Sorry. Uh, we have one more person, Teresa Council. Thank you. Um, so thanks for, you know, being upfront and transparent about the time commitment. I'm totally aware of that. I did a lot of research on it and, and understand the good thing is I'm flexible and also great at time management, which I think is a superpower that most moms and, uh, possess in order to just function these days. But, um, so I think what I would bring is there's a lot, there's clearly a lot of overlap with my personal work and my PTA work and the CEC work, um, and so I think I'm pretty engulfed in the city's educational system. I'm constantly reading and learning um, about what's going on, not only because of my interest in my son's education, but also because of the work that I do um, in early education. So I'm also a native Brooklynite. I grew up in an area in District 15. So I'm aware of the changes that many of the neighborhoods have. Um, I can use my experience, I think, with my, you know, my personal work, my volunteer work, my PTA work, my work with um, my working groups to help work, work through many of the challenges that we'll probably experience. I think one of my strong points is I am not afraid to use my voice in a respectful, obviously, manner um, and listen to others and learn. I'm constantly learning. And I think that's even one of the reasons that I wanted to come um, and be a part of this is just to learn more about what the system kind of behind the scenes is. As a parent, you kind of get the notices and you know when the changes are happening, but I really always think about kind of the steps before that happens. And so I think I have a unique perspective in that, that I'd be, you know, very excited to share and to learn. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to move to the President Council questions. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elton. I'm the co-president of the District 15 President's Council, and we represent all of the PTAs and PAs uh, in our district. So I've got a couple questions tonight, the first of which is related to austerity cuts. So in a time of increasing cuts to school budgets and subsequent elimination of enrichment programs for our students, PAs and PTAs have become more important than ever. What strategies would you employ to support and empower these organizations? And um, we're going to throw it right back to Teresa. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. So, you know, I have to 
deal with this often at work as well with um, money for my programs being cut. And so we're always trying to think of creative ways as well as my work on the, the PTA at 130. Um, I think it's really looking into outside funding grants. Um, I've written grants before uh, for work and had to do that. So I think it's really researching other opportunities. I think they're out there. Um, I think it's about also recruiting people to the PTA and to th that have that skill set. I think we have really uh, great parents with a ton of skill sets that are able to do that. Um, and it's really just kind of attracting them and looking into other ways and how we can get those. Because the bottom line is we know that they're going to be cuts, but how can we still you know, be sustainable, hold the programs that we hold important to us? Um, and, and still have that level of education. And I think, you know, that's through grants and through finding these other opportunities. So it's about research. It's about knowing the right places to look, um, which I have to do in, in my professional life often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, another call for Isabel. Isabel on. Okay, then we'll go to... Uh, Yasmin. Hi. Um, so, I, I sound, uh, if you could just repeat the question for me one more time, because my kids are making noise outside of the door. <laughs> so I That's apologize. Great for all of us. <laughs> uh, at a time of increasing, and it's no problem at all, in a time of increasing cuts to school budgets and subsequent elimination of enrichment programs for our students, PAs and PTAs have become more important than ever. What strategies would you employ as a CEC member to support and empower these organizations? Well, first of all, if I lack knowledge in this, I would also, I would want to ask Antonio and Jonathan about their suggestions and learn from them because I do look up to them. Uh, I would try to research programs that can be within the budget. Um, maybe if there's uh, different districts that are, using programs that worked well for them and within their budgets that we could switch out with what we're already using. Um, but I would have to do research and um, increase my own knowledge. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. And right here, Katina. <laughs> Um, great. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's something that we're feeling really acutely um, at PS10 as we're, you know, as we're facing down some of those cuts. Something I've been thinking about a lot, um, along with my fellow co-treasurer, Namitha Patel, who's on the call as well. I, I'm not sure. I mean, something that I think about in the PTAs is there's there's so much turnover all the time because we're always volunteers. It's parents who have time one year, not the next. Their kids move on. There's a constant churn of people and information, and it makes it really, really hard to have continuity. Um, and I, I'm not sure that there's, you know, a ready-made solution for that, but it's one of the issues that's on my mind is how can we help to bridge some of those, um, you know, some of that chronology so that there's uh, more information sharing over time within a single institution, but also how can we help knit together some of those, uh, some of the folks within the PTAs across schools to share knowledge across as well. We've been reaching out to some of the other treasurers at other schools just to get a sense of even like, you know, what banks do you use? How do you, how do you set up your spreadsheets? Like how do you actually do the nuts and bolts of, um, of the volunteer work? Because we don't, none of us know when we first step into the role. Um, and so I think that anything, I mean, obviously fundraising matters a ton and is going to continue mattering more and more over time. But along with that, I think anything to ease the burden of information sharing, of networking, of sharing communication within the school and across um, is something that I would wanna to work towards. Thank you. Um, All right, and next we'll, we good? Yes. Awesome. Next, we'll go to Dana. Um, I think everybody answered this question actually really well um, in thinking about, like, it, it's a mix of things. It's advocacy. How do we help our, you know, our parents associations and PTAs advocate for, you know, restoration of funding, increased funding with, um, you know, the local politicians um, and really using data to show 
what the work that is, you know, why it's needed, what it'll do, and how it'll help support our kids. Um, I think also it's the alternate funding, as everyone's talking about, looking for uh, grants, educational foundations, where can local businesses uh, come in and support a school or support a group of schools, uh, financial transparency. So making sure that we know where the money's going, what it's being used for. Um, is it really, is, are, is, are the priorities, you know, money really going to the priorities? And do we really know what the priorities are? Sometimes, you know, I think things come in and some people want it, but it's not really communicated to the whole school community that this is where we want the money to go. And also, I very much agree with the resource sharing. How across the district can that resource sharing happen so that we learn from each other? Um, I know right now, PS39 has been supporting um, uh, 124 with the, um, you know, with a lot of volunteer work and a lot of... Uh, for all of the migrant um, families that are coming in and need everything. And so, you know, we've partnered with them to really try to support, I think, more of that. Um, uh, I, fundraising initiatives, um, we see a lot of it at like 39. We have a ton of fundraising initiatives, sometimes maybe too much. And I don't know if it gets diluted. I think just looking at, you know, sometimes there's sort of overkill and are people starting to ignore things because there's so many of them that they get lost. So I go back to also data, um, really looking at how the, you know, how that fundraising is happening, um, where the, where's the money going and, you know, what works best in terms of fundraising. Thank you, Dana. And finally, for this question, how would your leadership impact? Oh, excuse me. Wait, did we get everybody? Uh, no, Jocelyn, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a t been a ton of really great things said. I think if I was coming to PTAs um, as a district member, knowing that they were going to be facing really difficult budget cuts, I would want to appreciate them and then empower them. So, lit like more specifically, like throwing them a party celebrating them um, I'm not talking about spending money but I'm talking about first and foremost acknowledging the effort that has been made the knowledge that is in the room um, the expertise that's already there amongst your parent community and the wins that that have taken place um, first and foremost I don't think people feel appreciated in these roles enough and I think a little bit of appreciation goes a long way um, and then, you know, looking ahead when we as uh, the council have a clear understanding of the budget and the cuts and the challenges so that we can sort of chart the course, at least, I would think that it would be really great to review low hanging fruit fundraising strategies. Again, a lot of the fundraising knowledge is there in the community. Um, it might need to be organized and put into a training or maybe a fee for a trainer can be sourced. Um, but I think it's really important to appreciate people first, um, understand that there's a lot of knowledge in the room and think about unlocking that knowledge in an organized way. So if we know that we have a lot of fundraising efforts ahead, let's talk about what has worked, what we've already done successfully, what always works. And then we're gonna think about new ways of fundraising. Um, I know in the arts, we rely a lot on the budgets given by council members and the relationships between uh, council members, arts organizations and schools is a really wonderful one. Um, sometimes to the tune of $20,000 a school year to do very with very few strings attached in terms of reporting um, to trust in our, an institution, an arts institution to come and support an arts program at a school, for example. Um, but I think preparing, uh, again, like one of those fundraising strategies might be refreshing all PTA members on how we communicate with council members. What does effective evidence look like? Is it a letter writing campaign? Is it going to an event and meeting them in person? Um, I think it really helps to, again, appreciate people first and then give them some tools so that they feel like they have 
something to work with for the fight ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, one more question from the President's Council. It's a short one, but not one with an easy answer. How do you feel about the District 15 diversity plan? And how would your leadership impact desegregation and DEI instruction in our schools? Uh, I'm going to start with Yasmin. You got me. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're talking about, but if I could follow up with you in an email, I will do that. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> Uh, well, let me clarify, even if you're not particularly familiar with the District 15 diversity plan, um, I think the, the question still stands, how would your leadership impact desegregation and diversity, equity, and inclusion instruction in our schools? Okay, so um, I feel like with anything, so I have my background in nursing and nursing education. So anytime that there's an issue that arises, the first step that we always do is take a look at what the policy is now and um, take a look and analyze and see what changes need to be made. And, uh, and I had mentioned this before, um, collecting all the facts, all the data, um, finding out what the core issue is, having open communication, and, and possibly even seeing what works in other kinds of school, um, in, in other districts, and possibly implementing that. And what could happen is um, when, if and when we want to launch something different to do it in a kind of like a pilot uh, for like a certain amount of weeks and maybe to test it out on a couple schools before we make it a district-wide um, implemented uh, change. Uh, so I think that's how um, I will tackle um, if there's any, any issues in terms of diversity or inclusion. Can, Thank you, Yasmin. Can we say what the District 15 diversity plan is? I mean, like, just we have a lot of candidates who have very, very young children, and the intention of the question wasn't necessarily to stump people. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, so the District 15 diversity plan was the plan to end screened middle schools in District 15. Very, very simply put, there were other th other aspects to it, but that is the the simple summary of, of what that plan is. Uh, so thank you, Antonia. So then, it <laughs> sounds like my answer is not a good one. <laughs> but uh, uh, we could just keep it moving. It's fine because I'm really not sure how to answer that. Uh, because I would I would want to take a look at what's already in place. If there is a screening in terms of middle schools, if it's if it has to do with um, if they're middle class, lower class, or district zoning, you know, I would want to take a look at what the details are, um, and then I would be able to correct my answer. <laughs> but thank you. You can move on to the next person. Thank you, Esmond. Thank you, Antonio, for clarifying that. Uh, and next will be Katina. Sure. <clears throat> Oof. Um, it's such a big question. Um, I have been, so my kids are still young, uh, but we've got middle school on the horizon at this point. And so some of our peers are starting to go through the middle school process with their kids. And I have been so impressed to know that D15 has taken these steps to change what always feels like a really deeply entrenched system. Um, I I know that no system is going to be perfect, um, and I don't know that it can be given how just how deeply the roots of racism and segregation go in our city's history and our nation's history. It's so deeply tied to housing. It's so deeply tied to um, all kinds of other issues that go well beyond the scope of what a PTA or a CEC or or um, uh, even the DOE can do. That said, it doesn't mean that, you know, every policy is equal. And I think that um, taking what feels to me like a bold choice to end those screening programs um, in a district where um, there is a lot of disparity in terms of wealth and access, um, 
has been, I think, transformative. I mean, again, my kids are not at that stage yet, and I um, I don't know all the details either, but um, it makes me proud that the district has, has moved in that direction. Um, as for what I would bring, I, mean, I recognize that I'm a white lady uh, coming into a position and talking about a question around DEI in a district that is very diverse. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, my, my background is what it is. My identity is what it is. Um, I do bring with me a lot of care around issues of, of equity and diversity. Um, something that has come up just by way of example in our PTA recently, um, we've been noticing along with the other kind of demographic changes in our school, we've been noticing an even more rapid change among the uh, the PTA as far as the demographics. It's Our PTA is wider than our school community um, is uh, as a whole. Um, and we've been trying to ask ourselves why that is and what it might be about the ways that we are embodying leadership and presenting leadership opportunities to the school community that may or may not feel welcoming to certain folks within the school. Um, I think that those conversations are always very difficult and always very important. Um, and I've been pushing to start having those conversations within the PTA um, as of this spring. We're going to bring in the Center for Racial Justice at um, and Center for Racial Justice and Education, which I think was part of the D15 um, diversity plan process, uh, to lead some trainings that are targeted both to parents and um, to teachers. Even though as PTA we're kind of you know, both and, and neither, uh, we're not teaching in the classroom, but um, because we're making decisions in, in many ways on behalf of the school, we wanna be aware of the ways that we're showing up. And um, I, try to, I try to bear those things in mind in every decision that I'm making. I try to be mindful of when I'm stepping up and when I'm stepping back. Um, and I think that the questions of, of equity within our district um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I think that the background that I'm bringing from CUNY, uh, the background of working with students um, from every walk of life across the city, um, has flavored the way that I think about what it means for education to be a public good. Um, and um, I want to be in service to you know to what I think that can look like. So. Thank you, Kate. Okay. okay, we should be able to hear you now, Jocelyn. Hello. Hi there. Um, I'm also not very familiar with the context um, of this proposal, um, but I would be very curious to know what middle school students, maybe they're now high school students, think about it. Um, I would want to know what students think about the decision by the adults to change the way that students are screened to join them in school. Um, I think from being in the workplace as a millennial with Gen Z as well as Gen X, boomers, and even the greatest generation in still holding board positions and in the workplace, I find that Gen Z and younger know a lot more about the spectrum of identities and how to treat others um, than I would expect middle-aged people to, with all due respect. I would really love students to have uh, a strong say in the program's rollout, why it's being rolled out. Um, and I think that's a great, way to engage alumni, meaning high school students, in the betterment of the middle school experience for younger students in their district. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, next, we'll go to Teresa. Okay, so it seems like the, the process was commendable that there were you know, many different stakeholders brought to the table 
um, throughout it. And so I think it's really commendable that they add that. I talked to a lot of colleagues and um, other parents who do have students that are in middle school. And I think middle school is always just such a stressful thing going from elementary to middle school. And I think this helped alleviate it. And I think it helped, obviously anything that can help the diversity is a good thing. As Katina mentioned, like the systemic issues are really deep and run deep and we can talk about that, you know, all evening, but I think steps that we can take like this kind of are moving the needle. Um, you know, as a Puerto Rican woman with a mixed race child, like diversity was honestly my number one thing when I was choosing a school. And that's what I found in PS 130, not just like multicultural, but different demographics. Like I wanted my son to have a real view of what the real world um, was like. And I think that's so important. And we also often find that the PTA doesn't really reflect what the school body um, looks like. So we're also thinking about that. And what I think I can bring is I'm always trying to be the voice in keeping us grounded because I think I can, because of my work, I'm usually the voice for the underserved or the lower demo, um, socioeconomic demographics that I'm kind of always bringing that perspective in that, you know, we have to remember the voices in the room aren't the only ones that need to be reflected in this. And I think a lot of times we think we're being inclusive or we mean to be what we aren't. And even in PTA meetings, you know, if it's English isn't your first language or Spanish and you're in an in-person meeting, you're not going to come. And culturally, why? Maybe your voice, you know, you don't think it should be heard in certain situations. So I think there has to be a lot of work around making it feel inclusive um, and really talking about like the roles of PTA, the roles of these councils and how that can actually make a difference in their child's education system. Because, because not all places, and if you come from another, like it's not always like parents have a voice in it. So I think that's new. And I, so I think there's some education that can be done um, around that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, Dana. Um, thank you. So this this question is a is a big one for me. Um, when I start started the Positive Learning Collaborative, um, it was about 2012, right after the 2011 Civil Rights Report came out, and you know, showing the disparities, especially in regard to discipline across the country, but in New York City in particular. At the time, I was working for District 75, and we were getting really high rates of referrals of kids coming in kindergarten. Um, you know, cognitively able, but presenting with challenging behaviors in their classrooms and being, you know, teachers, principals in our, you know, gen ed schools, not understanding how to connect to them, how to support them, how to build relationships, regardless of at that time, um, we were, we, we knew that it was about racism. We knew the, the depth of that, but we knew that when we started talking about it, people tuned us out. And, you know, so we really focused initially on shifting the mindset around discipline, on what you're doing isn't working. And this was back in the Bloomberg, you know, end of the Bloomberg era of zero tolerance. Um, and people really, I think, especially teachers, were frustrated with I don't know what to do when this kid, whoever this kid was, is doing X, Y, Z in my classroom and I can't teach and I can't focus and the other kids can't focus and people are getting hurt. And they really weren't looking at, you know, the deeper issues and it was push kids out because I don't know what else to do. So we started doing restorative practices back then by teaching it from pre-K up, looking at, um, you start out by restorative practices don't work if you don't build a community. So you know, you start out with community circles, you start out teaching, how do we get to know each other? And you do that from a young, young age. And by the time kids are, you know, it's if it's happening everywhere, they get more and more used to it. So a lot of the times, especially with restorative practices and inclusive classrooms, people are coming to it um, without that foundation. They see it as, you know, restorative, oh, well, it's once harm's done. Well, that doesn't, it doesn't work if you don't have a community to restore too, in the first place. So I think there's a real lack of education around what a lot of these uh, supports and, you know, curriculums are. And there's also a lot, a lack of teaching in the classroom to the two teachers and principals and coaching. These are practices. Everything that we do is a practice. It's a pursuit. It's not in, there's no end, you know, and we keep working at it. There's no perfect, but often schools are given a training 
and they're told, here you go, go ahead, you're going to learn this new thing. And now you're going to turnkey it to every other teacher after you just learned it yourself. Um, and that ends up with a big backlash of we don't want to do this. We also then in our schools have, you know, guidance counselors running around like, you know, chickens with their heads cut off because they're dealing with incidents and issues and they're frustrated and they're not able to spend the time to communicate, you know, why they're able to support this child and what's happening for this child in the classroom. And the bigger system and the school teams need to be looking at, you know, what are the bigger issues in the school and how do we communicate in regard to, you know, equity um, to our families without people feeling that they've done something wrong. And I think there was a, you know, I, I love the work of Goldie Muhammad um, and her you know, cultivating genius and her five pursuits. She really looks at the skills that you need to become culturally and historically responsive, not just the mindset, because people want to do something, but they don't know what to do. And they see policies happening without really having that deeper knowledge. Um, where And Dr. Muhammad's work really gives you a framework for what do I do? How do I think about this relationship with a child? Not just, you know, in fear or with a parent. You know, what might a parent who's, you know, felt isolated and pushed out in their own schooling feel when they're called in to come to a meeting and they have five professionals sitting around a table, um, you know, talking at them? And so I think that kind of emotional component really pushes people away or can bring people in. And to me, a lot of any plan is helping get rid of the fear, helping people see that this is better for all of our kids. It is better for every, whether you are white, black, Puerto Rican, everything, um, you are better for knowing each other and for connect, you know, connecting with each other and having, or for me and for my kid, I want my kid to know everybody. I want to understand everybody. I want to learn about everybody and to be curious and not afraid um, to ask questions and to, you know, and again, I say this also as a white woman, having done this work, I did this work alongside people who experienced it every day and experienced the racism every day themselves. Um, and we did a lot of listening, you know, so as soon as it's the situation place to listen, not just talk, even though I keep talking. That's all right. Thank you. We got it. We're going to have to cut, cut you off at this point. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, thank you all for uh, those great uh, uh, answers. Um, okay, I'm going to move to our council questions now. Um, I know that I have a question from Vanessa Gonzalez, who is on the line. Um, do you want to unmute yourself, Vanessa? I'm here. Okay. Okay, so thank you all for such a thoughtful process of uh, engaging with this council to apply and to answer all questions. Um, as we strive to foster an environment where every student feels valued and has an equal access to education, District 15 has continuously examined the multifaceted factors that contribute to achieving true inclusivity um, and that also becomes a factor when it comes to global issues that we discuss inside schools uh, and within our communities. So I would like to know what your thoughts are on inclusivity in public schools and what factors you believe should be considered when providing equal opportunities for education. All right, we will go to the Yasmin. Okay, um, I'll just tell a story about my background. I almost failed the sixth grade. I really did. I came from an immigrant family. My parents migrated from Palestine. My parents never graduated. Um, my father never graduated from junior high school. He never graduated. My mom never graduated high school. I basically taught myself and almost failed the sixth grade. At that, at that point, um, middle school started... Uh, so my elementary school went up to the sixth grade during that time. Um, and then <clears throat> middle school was seventh and eighth. So um, like this whole diversity plan is new to me. So I don't even know 
I was completely clueless and on my own when it came to transitioning from elementary school into middle school. Um, so just using myself as an example, I would want to make sure that um, that my experiences would not be, um, how should I say this? Like, I, I don't want the children in the system to go through what I went through. Yes, eventually I, I graduated from college. I got my master's degree, so it's still possible. But I didn't get the help that I needed um, when I was in elementary school. And maybe things were different then than they are now. Maybe things are better now. Um, but that's, again, that's why I'm joining the CEC so I can make sure that my kids have more and a better opportunity than what I had and more than what my parents, um, the more than what my parents ever had. Um, I hope I answered the question. Uh, I think I went off on a tangent, um, but thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, Katina Rogers. Okay, let me. So, all right, thanks. <clears throat> um, so you asked what factors should be considered? Oh, no, it's okay. I'm just, uh, yeah, mulling, mulling it over. Um, you asked what factors should be considered and what true inclusivity looks like in terms of students having equal access to education. Um, in terms of what factors should be considered, I mean, I think it's a multifaceted thing. I mean, we know historically that certain groups tend to be underserved by educational systems. We know that Black students, we know that uh, students who are from immigrant families, especially from certain regions, um, we know that students with disabilities tend to be underserved by the system. And so I think certainly addressing and being attuned to the needs that we're hearing from communities that we know are historically underserved um, is one really important part. I think the other thing, though, is that you also mentioned global issues, and I think that the, the terrain is often changing underneath our feet. And so I think also having an openness to recognizing that there may be needs that we don't yet know exist, or there may be needs in the future that aren't current needs now um, among communities who maybe are, are already a part of our schools and maybe are not. Um, so I think that there's also um, a, a fluidity and a need to listen that goes with that. I think, I'm not sure like what points of connection already exist between the CEC and um, like organizing communities. Um, I know I've done just a little bit of volunteering with um, South Brooklyn Mutual Aid, and I know that they are so deeply on the ground in working with folks who really need support. Um, at first it was, uh, you know, people who, needed help during COVID, now they've transitioned to, to working more with migrant families. Um, and so talking to folks who are working directly with communities that might be having trouble with the school system and might not have the social capital to express the, the challenges that they're having, might not know who to go to or who to ask questions of, um, also strikes me as a really important part in thinking not just about diversity, which I think often takes on kind of a you know, a check the boxes representational mode, but really thinking about what that community sense of inclusion looks like and feels like to folks who are in, in inside. Thank you. Um, Dana? Honestly, I think oh, everybody- Nobody can hear me. Okay, sorry, Dana. Yeah, yeah sorry. I think everybody answered this really well. Um, I don't know, I don't think I have an answer to what exactly which things should be included. Um, I think that it is a constantly changing and we look back to, you know, what things were like, uh, prior to 2016 and, you know, would we have really, I mean, I would have maybe thought some of what's happening now is happening, but I wouldn't necessarily, not to the extent it is. Um, so I don't, I mean, my question, I actually, for you in, in the question is, are you asking in terms of inclusivity like ex like what what disabilities race um religion like what are the what are the category or what do you what exactly do you mean by components of inclusivity um vanessa do you want to elaborate 
Sure, I can elaborate. Uh, so, as uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot your name. Yasmin? No, it's Dana. No. Dana, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm terrible. That's okay. That's okay. As Dana mentioned, uh, we do have an evolving sort of ecosystem globally at 2016 elections, global issues, and things kind of uh, permeate in our schools and the environments that we. Uh, have in the dynamics between students and teachers and the community as a whole. So um, as these issues arise, um, we are hyper aware of our need to adjust and uh, figure out how we are going to, as a cohesive community, move forward. And it's always a, a fine line to walk uh, when we're thinking about inclusivity in a district that's very diverse, that has many needs for many types of uh, communities. And we are always thinking about what factors should we bring onto the table or should we be aware of when it comes to creating equal opportunities for education for students. Um, so it, it's, it, it's kind of picking your brain, the question is picking your brain on what do you think about it? How do you think situations like this should be handled? How we as a community, as District 15, um, should we examine this constantly evolving situations? Thank you. Thank you for um, clarifying that. And I think it is about one data, knowing what's going on, knowing as things change, because it's always going to change and there's never going to be a one catch all. It's going to fix things and stay that way. So it's being able to move with the times, you know, and what's happening, getting that information um, for me. And the other is, I, I mean, this may be very uh, um, I politically incorrect, but I mean, I look at a school like my son's and we have an extremely active PTA Parents Association. There's a ton of money in fundraising coming in. And, you know, I, and that's great. But at the same time, I don't know that every school in District 15 has that kind of funding and that kind of money coming in from the Parents Association. And um, it it creates even more inequality, even though I think it's so valuable for our school. At the same time, you know, I don't know, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make a, a, every kid in every school in the district have the same sort of quality education when one school is able to do X and, and another school is not. And I don't have a solution for that, nor am I suggesting take up the issue right now, but I, I certainly think it's something to be thought about and I'm sure it has been. Great, thank you so much. Um, Jocelyn Bonadio de Freitas. Did we lose John Jocelyn? No, she's here. I just saw her. Wait a minute. Hmm. Hi. I oh, okay. There you are. Then came back. Sorry. Um, Should we read the question again? Or? No, I think. I think I understand the question and I appreciate the added clarity. Um, I think that's a really tricky question. Again, I think that I um, I'm just at the beginning of this experience of having a public school student and I can only imagine um, how challenging it is. I have run programming in um, one school that's coming to mind is a school called Newcomers High School in Long Island City, where the entire student population has recently arrived um, immigrants. But I think it's it's about what the um, folks have mentioned so far, which is equity. If anything, the pandemic really taught the organization I was working in. Uh, I think she's having... She's here, but it's she's having connection difficulties. 
she could or we could come back to we could come back to her um uh um jocelyn if you can hear us we lost your connection and we're going to move on to teresa and then we're going to try to come back to you so i think um the other candidates had a, a lot of, of of good ideas and i kind of echo those and even just thinking about offering opportunities to be heard to speak about the differences um just to also be aware to understand those difficult the differences um, and cultural differences as mentioned, folks coming to the country, um, newcomers, the difficulties that they might be having adjusting to different cultures, um, and then maybe moderated discussions talking about it. I know often there's so much going on in the world and things that are reflected in our schools and how can we talk about those things in a respectful way to understand each other and to better understand. And maybe that'll help parents feel more included as well. I mean, it's so complex because if you think about just the LGBTQ and the um, students with learning disability, like we can go on and on about all of the um, people that need to feel included. But I even think like on the ground things like just culturally relevant celebrations and learning opportunities and discussions in the classroom, part of the bigger, um, school communities at the PTA meetings, um, diverse culturally responsible curricula. And I mean, I think COVID did a good idea of unearthing some of the things that I knew working in underserved communities, but the digital divide that everything is not equal, right? People didn't have access to simple things like Wi-Fi or tablets or things. And so how homework isn't always equitable because not everyone has someone at home that's able to help them with that. So kind of taking keeping these all of these ideas on in the back of your mind as we're going through and making these you know new legislative and all these new things that are coming up realizing how it's going to affect each and every member of our school community that we're lucky enough to have a diverse one in district 15. thank you thank you all right we'll try to go back to jocelyn I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. Sure, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, I I generally was was reiterating what what folks have said around equity. I would also echo and was before I got cut off. Um, that I was. I think the pandemic really revealed this. Uh, the nuance in literally a household by household situation at times. Um, so maybe it is time to to think about equity with new eyes, um, considering how dynamic it is, and that is an area where parents can be um, connected across previously considered demographics. Maybe these big buckets of race, ethnicity, and language, even religion, aren't necessarily the most important um, connections that can be made and identified, um, even thinking in a really asset heavy way about, about families and students who are joining a community. Um, but I, I appreciate the question because I think also that schools are being asked to do more than their fair share of what it means to support a dynamic, diverse community. Um, and I think that that also sending that message to council members and, and, and other representatives at the city level, they need to know um, the range of issues that schools are being asked to deal with because at a, at a certain point, and it's probably past that point, it's, it's not very fair. Um, we're asking schools to do an impossible amount of, of service. Um, Great, yeah. thank you so much, thank you. Thanks, thank All you. Right. So, I don't know how we did this, but we're actually ahead of time. <laughs> um, and Hans, who is a CEC member, would like to ask a question. So I will turn it over to Hans. Hi, good evening. Uh, I have a question for everyone. Can you please give me one example of a time you had a disagreement with someone and how it was resolved? 
That's a really yeah. great question. Um, I'm just writing it down. Um, all right, we'll go uh, in reverse order, Teresa Council. An example of an argument, a disagreement that you've had and how you resolved it. Okay, so the one that's top of mind because it happened most recently is the um, the daycare center that I oversee is in a shared space. So we are in the basement of a private Catholic school and we have to use kind of um, some of their facilities, their gyms and things like that. So when things go wrong, we're constantly like calling them to fix. They say, no, it's your responsibility. So there's always kind of that back and forth. And so myself and the principal felt really strongly about it um, and had a very, you know, big disagreement about it. He felt that it was our responsibility. It had been something to me that we had been complaining about for quite a while. And I had all the paperwork, but, and it was the buildup of that, that now something broke down. And so we were at like a real standstill. Um, and I had to kind of step away because it was, you know, getting very <laughs> heated, but, you know, I honestly, we reached an agreement through compromise. I had to compromise some of it, although I felt very strongly in the fact that we should not be responsible for it. Um, I had to hear him out and understand that he's also working with a limited budget and we were, so we really came to like, just, we have to be transparent and honest with each other. Like, what can you afford to contribute to this and what can we afford? And that's literally how we came to the agreement. I also had to look at the bigger picture. We are going to work with each other for a long time. I respect him as a leader. I think he respects me as a leader. We just disagreed on this one, but I really had to kind of take ego and personal feelings out of it, which I think I do a good job of and just kind of look at the facts and understand something from his point of view. And honestly, we reached it through compromise. So I had to give in a bit um, and until we can get to something that was reasonable for both of us. And that is how we were able to, to overcome that obstacle because children had to go to school in both ends. So we had to make this decision really quickly. So we had to kind of, what I like to say is think about the bigger picture and stay to the mission. And I think when you think about the kids, you can get all over all of the adult stuff that gets in, in the way. Amazing answer. <laughs> Not probably one of the hardest questions of the night. Okay, uh, let's move on to Jocelyn Bonadio de Freitas. Yeah, um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, this question. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways of of dealing with conflict, but I think the most important one is knowing that conflict is inevitable. Um, so rather than you know avoiding it, it's important to have strategies for approaching conflict in your toolkit and kind of being prepared for it. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a human thing. Um, we can just get better at at dealing with it and handling it. Um, the story that was just told is a great example of that. Um, I also learn a lot from my three-year-old about conflict, taking the time to validate somebody else's feelings and letting them know that you're heard or even repeating back to them what they are asking for so that they feel understood is incredibly effective, both with toddlers and adults. <laughs> um, but we're talking about a time when I was in conflict. I, I do want to mention this. Um, this happened in January um, around Martin Luther King Day. My son's uh, 3K sent us the title of the book that they would be reading for the students and the book mentioned assassination um, because it was a book about Martin Luther King and they shared some of the language that they would be using when if and as they predicted students may be asking what assassination meant and I disagreed with the language and I disagreed with the choice to introduce assassination on Martin Luther King Day I felt, and I let the school know via email that I felt that the assassination was not an important part of Martin Luther King's legacy, especially in the context of three and four year olds, that the holiday is his birthday, something that all young children can understand and offered that they may read another book. Um, and the school did not budge, which was very disappointing for me, but I made the choice to um, keep my child home that day. and you know, communicated with the school about that choice, which they totally accepted. And while I still don't agree with the decision, um, I appreciated the fact that I could communicate with the school about it. 
and we sort of agree to disagree at the end of the day. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dana. Thank you. Um, I both of your stories for me. Um, I illustrate it so beautifully about, I think it's all about communication and problem solving. For me, if I'm able to not personalize, so you know, it's always the difference in your personal life versus say um, in a professional situation, um, In I put my skills to use. I was trained in therapeutic crisis intervention and we trained it for, um, it was the first cohort ever in New York City that became trainers in 2005. And so um, it's always, I always just say, it's amazing to use the skills like active listening and, you know, life space interview where you are, like Jocelyn actually just said it, you know, you're validating feelings and you're repeating something back and you're no, trying to know what the other person is really thinking or feeling um, instead of jumping in to, I, I feel something. So I need to like, you know, be confrontational in a, in an angry way versus confrontational and problem solving in a way that we ho hopefully both walk away happy. Um, I have had conflicts where I neither people walk, walk away happy. I mean, to be totally transparent with you, um, even the direction of positive learning collaborative and the, where the union wanted to go and wanted, you know, something watered down and wanted 1700 schools to get training versus what we designed, which was intensive coaching. Um, which you need more people for and you need more funding for. And so there are times you just have to sort of, I, for me, like you stand up for what you believe and you you do what you need to do for you or your child. And sometimes you give in and it's, you know, we both can figure out that compromise. Um, but I do think it's about conversations and really trying to know the other person. Um, the more that you know somebody, I think the and the more you appreciate them and value them, the easier it is to resolve problems. Great, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Katina, all right, let me, let me mute. Okay, thanks. Um, hybrid meeting dance. Um, yeah, this is a hard question for me to answer because uh, conflict is something that's really, um, uh, that I'm very averse to. And when I think about moments that I've been in conflict um, recently, um, the thing that I think about is that for me, the challenge has not been so much to hear the other person's side. I think that that, that part of it is more aligned with um, how I approach things naturally. What has been harder for me to learn is when it's important to actually stand up for my voice and for the voices of the people that I'm representing. And I'm, I'm thinking right now about something that was like fairly small um, in retrospect. It was not a major conflict, but it was something that involved um, a few members of the PTA and our principal. Um, we wanted to hold a budget town hall um, and we wanted to move fairly quickly because um, there was just, a, there were a lot of pieces in motion. I had recently learned from the CEC meeting um, what was at stake in terms of the citywide budgets. And we wanted to activate parents while there was energy um, to get involved, to take some of the actions that were being shared by um, uh, by folks who are involved in the CEC and, um, and to do so quickly. And our principal wanted to take a, a more measured approach and um, strongly advised us to, to not hold the meeting on the day that we had planned to hold it. Um, I think that my my usual response in that situation would have been to um, cede my position to the position of authority and say, okay, no problem, we'll wait. But in this case, um, I didn't see the downside of going ahead and informing parents um, of something that affected everybody. Um, and I felt like to not do so was a disservice to the community that I was beholden to and that I was representing. Um, and so in that moment, um, the principal and I were eventually both able to take a step back and recognize that we were coming to the question from the same set of values, that we wanted the same thing in the end, but we had a conflicting approach to how we thought that we could get there. 
Like others have said, we got there through compromise. I mean, we ended up changing the structure of what that meeting was going to look like and having the formal meeting a bit later, but still having an opportunity for parents to come and be a part of a discussion and get information if they wanted to be more involved. Um, but for me, that was a it was an interesting moment in realizing that um, representing people beyond just myself means sometimes I have to take a stronger stance than I might take if it was just for me. Um, and so being willing both to compromise, but also to stand up when needed has been something that's been, um, you know, an, an area of growth for me over the last couple of years, I would say. Thank you. Oh, because I'm muted. Nobody can hear me. Okay, sorry. Yasmin. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, so I just to repeat the question, it's uh, a disagreement that you have had in the past and how you resolved it, correct? Okay, just to just to make sure. Um, so with nursing, I'm so I I'm going to give a nursing example uh, because nursing deals with a lot of patient advocacy, family advocacy. And so sometimes things, um, disagreements could happen. Um, and no matter which profession you choose, disagreements, conflicts can arise. So one specific example that comes to mind, uh, this was early on in my nursing uh, career when I worked on the ICU unit. And uh, we were admitting a patient from the ER who was on airborne precautions and um, I was in charge that night and because I needed the patient to be in a negative air pressure room where, you know, like to keep the staff and the rest of the patients safe, I needed to move around some patients and that's a nurse driven um, thing that I did. And so the attending doctor was not happy about that. And Instead of um, instead of the doctor having like a conversation with me and further explaining, he instead he took off the airborne precautions from the patient's orders from the computer, and uh, he demanded that I switch the patients back, and so this would um, make it really unsafe for the entire staff and, and the patients with all the room switching. The patient was on airborne precautions because of suspected TB and he was HIV positive. Um, so there was a disagreement and conflict there and I refused to listen to the attending doctor. Um, I had to escalate it uh, using the chain of command. Um, so because I wasn't able to resolve it with the attending doctor. And so um, just to take that example and, um, and you could apply it with any profession where you try your best to resolve it on your level. And if, if, if the conflict or disagreement cannot be resolved, then you may need to escalate it using the chain of command. And this is also something that I teach the nurse residents in the nurse residency program about conflict resolution and that it could create stressful work environments. And so with nursing advocacy and trying to uh, tie it in with education, um, staff and the students and families need that advocacy as well. Um, so reflecting back, because that was early in my career, that attending doctor um, stopped talking to me and it was not um, being resolved. It, it was not resolved with the nursing supervisor getting involved. And unfortunately, reflecting back, this is something that um, I learned now, like later on in my nursing career, that sometimes it's difficult um, when, I mean, you guys could correct me, sometimes people are, could be set in their ways and no matter how polite you are, uh, sometimes um, no matter how much you're trying to follow policy and what's right, 
sometimes it could be difficult to still try to convince people, you know, to kind of get over their pride and um, being humble is some is a quality that I have. And it's hard when other people do not share the same qualities. So this is still something that's a learning process, even for me. And um, and I look forward to learning more. It's uh, nursing and education is forever changing. And sometimes bad things happen and that's when change is also implemented. And that's what it is, so thank you. Thank you, very, very interesting. Everybody gave very, very interesting answers. Um, okay, so we are, oh my God, we're like right on time. I have 8.20 written into my thing. It is exactly 8.20. Um, and we can uh, have time for uh, questions from the general public. Uh, is there anybody in the uh, in the audience on the Zoom? We don't have anybody in the audience uh, in person here, <laughs> but uh, would somebody from the audience like to ask a question? Just um, raise your hand. Do any of the other CC members on the call want to ask a question? I just want to say thank you to all of the candidates for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Antonia, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, how did the opening come about? Uh, we had a, a member who was unable to perform her duties. Um, if you read our bylaws, um, if a member misses a certain number of calendar meetings, uh, they forfeit their seat. Um, she did ultimately resign, um, and she just uh, wasn't able to attend meetings. And how of a term, so to speak, would you ideally like somebody holding such a seat to to retain? What is the term? Meaning, yeah, like how long would a council, uh, community education council member stay? So the term ends june 30th 2025. uh we i think you said this at the beginning we have meetings um generally twice a month on the first tuesday and the last tuesday of the month there can be more meetings as needed um so and then there's all the you know the additional time um, <laughs> that we put into this um <clears throat> so it's uh so yeah i lost my train of thought actually about what was there any other anything else you wanted me to ask me does that do any of the other um potential candidates have questions. I, I have yeah. a nuts and bolts question yeah. too. What is the difference between a calendar meeting and a business meeting? Oh, okay. So <laughs> uh, a business meeting is generally like vote on minutes, um, vote on like budget issues, committee reports. It's it's more like the internal workings of the council there's also no generally speaking there's no public comment mm -hmm. period in a business meeting though there can be um a calendar meeting is um there's always a public comment general public comment period that is when we have our um, superintendents reports when we'll have some of the 
bigger presenters like we had the IBO the last mm -hmm. meeting. Um, we, not every council does this, but we have our calendar meetings in other schools around the district mm -hmm. so that we can be in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, our business meetings are just held at 131 mm -hmm. Livingston Street though. I'll I'll take any other questions from from the from folks since we don't have any questions from audience members. Just general questions about being a CEC member. I mean, I'd like to know the best thing and the worst thing. The best thing <laughs> and the, the most rewarding thing that you feel like you've been able to do as a CEC member, and what has been the biggest drag. Uh, for me, I was elected in 2017 to um, push for the District 15 diversity plan. Mm -hmm. So for me, seeing that process through with um, WXY and our um, all of the stakeholders involved in that process mm -hmm. um, was extremely rewarding and in my view, I think you said it, it was a transformative um, process. Mm -hmm. And it that process led into our next rezoning, where we um, had a participatory action research team um, better understand the needs of the community before mm -hmm. we redrew the lines. Mm -hmm. So I think those sort of community building community engagement processes in conjunction with these um like statutory obligations mm -hmm. um has been really rewarding for me mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's the thorn the thorn <clears throat> I think that Hans hit it on the head when he said conflict mm -hmm. resolution. Yeah. That is also always really um, uh, difficult and stressful. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. So you have to just <laughs> dive into it, wade into it. <laughs> um, and try and listen and understand. I mean, you guys all said, said all, you know, said everything that, uh, you know, I'll just, if there's no other questions, it, it's, it's 8.30 or almost 8.30. I just want to say, I've never been more impressed by uh, a group mm -hmm. of candidates. No if, yeah. if I could have all of you, like, join our council I literally would like I was sitting here writing I am learning so much just listening to the answers to these questions this is not easy at all you know you had no knowledge of these questions prior uh, I'm I'm just so in awe I I love you all and I I can we can only vote to take one of you and I just hope all of you run again in 2025 yeah. because many of you have young children um ju just keep, get in it get in it get in it for 2025 mm -hmm. those elections are gonna probably start in, in next spring mm -hmm. um so you know yes, and especially if you have young yeah, it's, it's great to really like see this, this Yeah, and if you don't, you know, make it onto the council, certainly get involved in your your uh, your PTA, and then uh, you know, if your SLT is available to you, um, come to the CEC meetings. Keep coming to the CEC meetings. Uh, so we are we're going to close this meeting out I, I thank you all I think you're all amazing. Um, and we're going to um, convene a meeting on April 16th when we will we will vote um, to appoint one of you to the CEC. So thank you so much. Um, 
there was what is this oh somebody wrote um we have a recording that we post on youtube the recording is going to be posted onto youtube um so all right thank you all so much let me thank you thank you and good night good night all right so i need to close the meeting out on this computer oh that's yours do we save the do we save the um the chat oh the chat automatically gets saved okay good there's some questions on there thank you for